This is Learn From Others, where we interview a cross-section of successful individuals so you can learn from their experiences, achievements, and even their mistakes. We ask four questions that will educate and inspire. Greg Stanley will be your guide as we join our guests on a journey from adolescent daydreaming to success in today's world. Join us on this adventure as we learn from others together. Well, welcome to Learn From Others, where we help others succeed by sharing success. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest, Kevin Nichols. Kevin, thank you for taking us on your career journey. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Greg. Yeah, no problem. Well, before we find out what you're actually doing today, let's start at the very beginning. And can you tell us what you wanted to be when you grew up? <laughs> so, funny story about that. In <laughs> kindergarten, I actually remember standing up in front of the class at the the kindergarten graduation, and they, they did this question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I specifically said, brain surgeon. <laughs> you said br- um, brain surgeon? Brain surgeon. Nice. Yes. Now, at five, I don't think I really understood what that meant. I just knew that that was someone that was very, very smart and top of their field and what have you. So really it kind of evolved into, I don't know what I want to be ever. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a Uh, lot of people's stories. (laughs) Right, yeah. Like I actually put in my vows and and, uh, when I got married that I consciously will not age past 14. (laughs) (laughs) So I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. (laughs) That's dedication there. You put it in your vows. Nice. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, she had to know what she was getting into. So. Right. 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 Well, okay. Well, that will lead us into uh, what was your first job? And it could be one that you got paid, you know, to mow the lawns or it could be your first real job. Sure. Uh, my first job I got ever paid for was a, a paper route, which kind of showed me that maybe I'm not the hardest worker in the world. <laughs> I, I kind of I let some of it fall to my parents. And when I look back, on, I'm like, man, I was a really crappy paper boy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my, I guess my first job that I took somewhat seriously, I, I was a pharmacy technician when I was like 15, 16. Now, what does a pharmacy it? technician do? So the, I basically just kind of saw the scripts, counted out the pills, that I was allowed to count out, you know. They right. didn't let you deal with the narcs at 15 years old. But like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would count pills and do some customer service, check people out. Super simple. It was in a in a Kroger grocery store. So, Right, okay. So in school, were there any subjects that you or hobbies you had that you gravitated towards? I was very good at taking tests. Um, not actually so much retaining information but some <laughs> for some reason I'm a very good instinctual test taker so I didn't have to try too terribly hard I gravitated towards I liked math and I liked art which is kind of a conundrum uh, you don't hear that often <laughs> no you don't right so and and you know what what's funny is I've taken some of those stupid like how's your mind work internet tests and like I always get Equally left brain and equally right brain. <laughs> <laughs> Your centered brain. <laughs> Center brain. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But yeah, I think my dad's super artsy and out there. My mom is very, very logical and, you know, fact driven. So I guess I got the, the healthy balance of the two. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, what now, why don't you tell us what you do today? Because it sounds like you didn't really know what you wanted to be, and you're right down the center. So you're not too artsy. You're not too, or you're a little bit artsy, a little bit logical. So what do you do today? And if you would, tell us how you got there and include, like, any education, training, or jobs that kind of led you up to where you are, which I'm fascinated to hear exactly how you ended up where you are today. (laughs) Right, yeah. Yeah, well, it's a, it's an evolving story. Who knows how I actually got you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, since I could hold a pencil, I've loved to draw. Uh, it was it was how my mom got me to sit still. You know, she could leave me with a pen and paper, and I'd be good for hours. And it's kind of it's somewhat genetic. So my great grandfather 
Walter Camphouse was the president of the Cincinnati Art Academy at one point in time. And he did these beautiful scratchboard works. Uh, do you know what scratchboard is? Yes, I do, but go ahead and review it for our audience. Yeah, here. I'll explain it. So he would take his white paper, he'd ink over top of it, and then he would use a scalpel to pull away the ink, kind of bringing light to the darkness as opposed to what when you're really usually drawing, you take darkness and put it on the white. So he did it opposite. And the, what made his work so beautiful is that it was so perfect that almost none of the lines would touch. So you can take your scalpel and kind of scrape, 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 and get a big white area, but he would do it in these simple little lines. And it was just, you can stare at it for hours like, oh, my God, I can't believe one person did this. <laughs> like, Is that also so, called hatching, or is hatching different? So you can do a, a hatch pattern on the scratch board. Okay. But the main premise of it is, is it's you're bringing, you know, you're pulling the light out instead of putting the dark in. That's awesome. Um, I'll, I'll look, pull some pictures and, uh, and post them. Sure, sure. It's kind of it's hard to explain via words, but if you see it, you'll go, oh, I get it, I get it. So you got a little bit of the uh, genetic artist in you. That's good. Yeah, my dad was, was artsy, like I said. Well, he's still artsy. He plays guitar a lot, and uh, he helped me you know, develop my drawing growing up. Uh, he'll, he'll say that he's not good at drawing, but he's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Walk us through, like, after high school and where, did, where the, how did that progress? Sure. I kept going to art class, you know, throughout grade school, high school. And actually in high school, I had a teacher that pushed me in a way that I appreciate now, but it kind of pushed me away from it in, in high school. Uh, he was also my football coach, which is kind of funny. So I think he kind of translated how he could coach me in football into how he could teach me in art, and it just – it didn't compete with me, so he pushed me kind of too hard. Now that I look back, and I'm really happy he did because one of the things he always beat into my head was, you're not going dark enough with your pencils. I, could, I couldn't go dark enough for him. He'd send everything back. Wow. You're not going dark enough. Yeah, and um, now that I look back on it now, like that's what draws people to my work is I go – and the contrast that I can pull out because I was forced to go darker, darker, darker really, really helps me. So, And just for our audience, you do – how would you describe your artwork? So uh, on my business card, I call myself a photorealistic portrait artist. So I'll take photos and duplicate them as close as possible to the original image in – Pencil, and I only use 2B pencil on Bristol board for all the pencil nerds out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pencil a lot nerd. Of will... <laughs> no, okay, good, yeah. So a lot of people see it and they assume I use charcoal or some sort of pen or everything. No, it's just that ringing in my head. You, you're, you have to go darker. You have to go darker. So I use my 2B pencil and push it to its limits, and and that's what I get. <laughs> Just for our audience, your work is amazing. It is incredibly realistic, detailed, imaginative. I was just blown away when I saw it. And if you go to his website, which is thebeardedartist.net, you can go through your gallery. You can go to your Etsy shop. Uh, you do commissions. Uh, it is just absolutely gorgeous. Thanks for being on this podcast. Yeah, take us through some of the training you received, or is it all self-taught over the years? It's mostly self-taught. Yeah, that's what I tell every budding artist is just try to get better every time but um it's mostly self-taught throughout the years just hours and hours and hours of drawing and i did go to um antonelli college in downtown cincinnati for about a year i've gone to college on and off i'm like a professional student without a degree <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone to college a few different times, but I finally actually went to a graphic design college, and there was a drawing class that fine-tuned me a little bit, just kind of kind of reiterated, you know, the values, go darker, go lighter, and, you know, just help me with layouts and all that kind of stuff. But mostly, yeah, it's been self-taught and just, I don't know, a journey, really. I hope to keep getting better as I go. Now, walk us through your, a day in the life of... 
right now I'm I'm in kind of a learning phase. Like I I want to do more shows and I'm I'm in the process of learning what shows I do well in and what shows I don't and just, you know, weeding out all the shows that I'm just eh, I'm not doing all that well at. Um I do I love really I don't see myself so much as an artist as I am an entertainer. I did theater in high school and I just I I like to be fun for people. So it kind of gives me a platform to talk to people and show my art. I like, I do like to do the art, but I do, I would label myself personally as an entertainer. I'm trying to figure out what shows I can get in front of the most people and show my art and nerd out with them about different stuff. And so that, that entails some of the day I try to get in on average, you know, four to six hours of drawing a day. Sometimes I'm going for 12 hours straight. It's rare because my hand will cramp up. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm learning how to wear all the different hats and being kind of a solopreneur and planning out the shows, getting the Airbnb, you know, setting up my booth, making contacts, all that kind of stuff. And setting aside time to draw. And if there's any entrepreneurs listening, they're all probably shaking their heads like, oh my God, I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do have a, ner- a nerdy question for you. Do you draw standing up, okay. sitting down, uh, angled architecture desk? I'm just curious. Sitting down most of the time and hunched over, which I have to do exercises so my back doesn't give out on me. <laughs> but um, I get, so I'll do different lighting. I'll draw upside down, I'll draw sideways, I'll draw with my eyes squinted, I'll draw with my eyes wide open. Really? I try to take in, yeah, I try to take in every single, well, not every single, but as many different ways of looking at how I'm reproducing this photograph and trying to get all the details in. At the show, you had that one illustration from The Princess Bride, I forgot his name, the main character. (laughs) But he had his, yeah, he had his, Wesley, (laughs) right, Dread Pirate Wesley, he had his sword pointed at the camera, and you drew it so perfectly to where it actually blurred the tip of the sword point. I was like, how did you do that? Because it looks so, I mean, it's, you know, how do you draw a blurry shot? And I just thought it was amazing. I forgot your response, but it was pretty funny. Oh, my response to that is always, I draw the, the sharp parts when I'm sober and the blurry parts when I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Wow. When, uh, the, so flipping it upside down and drawing it in different light and stuff allows me to draw it objectively and just draw exactly what I see instead of what I think I see. So it's I'm just drawing that photograph. It's It's hard to explain past that. I'm just matching the lights and darks. I'm not trying to draw Wesley. I'm trying to match the lights and darks on the page. That's where my mind goes to. No, that makes sense because I know when I was drawing and I tried to capture the reflection of light, you know, where it might be a sharp edge here or look kind of like a triangular or something like that. I'd say, oh, it's a triangle, so I'll draw a triangle. Well, it really wasn't a triangle, you know. Right. I tried to quantify it into simpler terms to draw it, and it wasn't correct. So I could see, you, you know, flipping it over sideways, whatever, you're forced to draw it exactly as you see it, which is really hard because when you're thinking about what you're looking at, your eye translates so much. You know, being able to capture that is amazing. So, and that's probably why your your drawings are so striking is that you you are able to capture it that way. Yeah, that was yeah. yeah. So that was that was one of the tricks I learned from Antonelli was like different lighting, flipping it upside down, looking at it objectively. And then in high school, I had that go dark, 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 dark. So the two combined and you get what I put out. <laughs> now, are you left or right-handed? I am right-handed. Oh, okay. I'm a lefty. So I would, lefties have challenges because the way you draw, you end up smearing the lead if you're not careful. So, so I've had that explained to me a few times and I feel like it only really translates to writing because if you're drawing, yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, you're drawing an image. So, but my advice is I just I put paper under my hand, I wash my hands frequently, and I actually do I'll do like a drawing round and then an erasing round. And a drawing round and an erasing round. It keeps everything nice and clean and it brings that contrast popping off the page. So explain that a little bit more. You'll just draw, 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 and then you'll erase 
everything that you don't need. Right. So it does smear a lot, right? Like the graphite when you're using it. Well, and I'll, I'll, I'll get like some darker details and I know that in the middle of some of the details, maybe there's some smear. I could wait until the end and clean it up then. And sometimes the smear is not as easy to get up at that point. So I will do it progressively throughout the drawing so that it stays nice and clean while I'm drawing it. Does that make more sense? Yes. Yep, that does. And I know we're getting kind of nerdy on the technical side of it, so hopefully someone will find this entertaining. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, and you use what? You said a 2B, so the 1B was just too hard and the the 3B was too soft from a lead perspective? Yeah, that was another thing uh, at at Antonelli. Um, They pushed me to use a whole bunch of different types of papers, a whole bunch of different types of pencils, mediums, and all that kind of stuff. And when I was introduced to that, it just clicked. I was like, oh my, I don't want to do, I don't want to do anything else ever. <laughs> like, I want my 2B pencil on my Bristol board because it it just matched with my style, I guess. Yeah, I always had trouble on the Bristol board. I always thought it was a little too hard or too smooth. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people don't like it at all. It, and it does smear kind of more than some of the other drawing papers that can grab onto that graphite that's maybe that's why i'm so anal about you know erasing while i go but Uh, yeah i would use a 2h i think was recommended when i was an aspiring comic book artist and i just struggled so i gravitated towards the softer leads but then i would smear everything so i got a little frustrated (laughs) right (laughs) yeah the harder leads for the comic book makes more sense because you're you're drawing those tight characters but if you want to get the you know shading and depth and everything you kind of have to go into the softer lids for sure right right well before we move on to our next question let's take a moment to hear from our sponsors do you enjoy your job and find it fulfilling or do you spend more time wondering what if instead of what's next if so contact career spa Career Spa has extensive programs and curriculum and understands the challenges faced by individuals in transition. They can teach these success practices to be mastered for an effective job search. Answer that what if question by contacting Career Spa and asking their experts, what's next? Contact Career Spa at careerspa.net. Talent acquisition is key to building a successful organization. Talent Connections is a professional services firm that specializes in recruiting, including executive search, contract recruiting, talent acquisition consulting, and recruitment process outsourcing. Whether you are an individual or a Fortune 100 company, Talent Connections can connect you with success. Contact them at talentconnections.net. All right, welcome back. We just learned what you wanted to be when you grew up, which when you were five, it was a brain surgeon, and what you actually do today, which is photorealistic portraits. Is that how you phrased it? Photorealistic portrait artist. Now, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? Man, that's such a that's such a crazy question. Um, I wouldn't have, this one kind of comes to mind, I wouldn't have been stubborn enough to think that I could do everything all by myself <laughs> for the couple of years. So it was kind of a side hustle for maybe five years or so. It's been full time for coming up on two years. And when I was first starting, I just kind of wanted to do my own thing and not hear input and not have any business advice. And I'm like, I'm just going to do it all myself. You know, you, got, you know, that romantic lone wolf right. mentality, which is completely a myth um <laughs> well maybe maybe it's right it's a myth in my own mind um because of all the help i've actually been able to receive now but yeah i wouldn't have waited as long to ask for help like how do, do i promote this how do i advertise this what do i need to do here for taxes what do i need like i would try to learn all that and i get overwhelmed and not get anywhere so i finally learned hey I have a family member that's, you know, a, an accountant. Let's go ask them. Like, <laughs> right. It makes sense. <laughs> right. A when phone I call. Back, I'm like, how, why was I so stubborn about that? But like I said, it's that lone wolf thing. So. But, yeah, so I guess so that's the main thing. As I started the business, if I could go back and redo it, I would have asked for help instantly <laughs> instead of waiting a couple years of horrible confusion. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. 
Is there anything else you would do? Is there a, would you have gone to a specific uh, school or is there a place you've heard that's great that you recommend for someone? No, honestly, and I don't want to be, you know, anti-school. I think it's a great thing, but like when you when it comes to artists, if there's an artist that has a little bit of talent here and there and just wants to kind of expand on it, school is great. I was lucky to have a friend, another artist friend who had gone through like 4 or 5 years of like a pretty intense art school. And I was thinking about doing it at the time. This was, I don't know how many years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And he told me, he's like, look, you know everything you need to know. Like, that's going to be a waste of your time. Like, right, right. And, 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 and I was, I mean, I was like this close to pulling the trigger. And he told me, that. I was like, man, I have to reevaluate. And he's like, he's like, for, for what you have, just go with that. Like, you don't need art school you're just going to come back to this anyway and i went here yeah you're probably right <laughs> right you had learned enough on your own to make it not worth the effort it sounds like correct yeah well what advice would you right. give someone who would like to do what you're doing so artists are their own worst critics i think that's just a human thing but it seems like it rings truer in artists my best advice is don't compete with anyone but yourself because there's there's no one on this planet that you can compete with fairly but yourself. You're the only one that's had your life. So you do your artwork and just when you're finished, sign it, be done, and get better on the next one. And then get better on the next one and just keep competing with yourself. That's the best way to not get in the, you know, the comparison as the thief of joy phase where you're like oh I could never be as good as you or oh I could never do that and it's like well it doesn't matter you can be better than you were yesterday you can definitely do that so just do that <laughs> that's great that's advice kind of, yeah it keeps it real that, that actually came up on one of my other interviews with Abe Moreno who, who is a videography or a, a video artist he makes content but he does some artwork as well and he's like at some point you just got to step away from the canvas or else you'll be there forever because you just don't, yeah. you got to know when to let it go. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Uh, my rule is once I've, once I've signed it, I'm not allowed to touch it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I sign it and I'm done. That's I good. I put on my fixative and I'm not allowed to touch it. <laughs> uh, I was going to say that's really good because if it met your standard at one point to sign it, going back, right. it's futile. Exactly. Well, are there any current projects you're working on that you would like to share? So a lot of the stuff I do is like, Missions for presents, so I can't really talk. To <laughs> right, much, so. someone, someone's having uh, a birthday. <laughs> um, I am working on a fun. I've only done a couple crossovers, and uh, by crossover, I mean taking like fictional universes and throwing them together in a drawing. And I keep getting a lot of attention for the one I did with um, Doc Brown and his DeLorean racing doctor who in his tardis and it's kind of the inside view of the delorean and you can see doctor who outside of the windshield kind of looking in like what's going on here and when you go to the comic cons you see all these awesome mashups and i've only done a couple that one keeps grabbing attention so i'm working on one right now i don't know if i should say well i'll just tell you it was actually my wife's idea have you, you've heard of Negan from The Walking Dead? Yes. Carrying his bat around all the time. Yep. So he, his whole mantra is, I am Negan, I am Negan, I am Negan. And um, and then there's Groot. I am Groot. I right. am Groot. So <laughs> I'm drawing a picture of, of Negan holding his bat, and as it goes behind his head, it's going to transform into Groot. And then I'll just put I am dot, dot, dot. At the oh, that's cool. Let people choose. <laughs> That's cool. You know, it's funny. I saw that DeLorean, and I didn't see Doctor Who because I was so involved in the details of the DeLorean because I'm a huge car guy. So I saw Doc Brown. I saw the DeLorean, but I didn't look through the window because I was looking at the interior of the car so closely. A lot of people miss him, and uh, I usually I try to put a light on him so that it pops out. But it's it's almost more fun that way because then when people do see him, they're like, oh! <gasps> Oh my God, there's Doctor Who. <laughs> right, right. It's those multiple layers. Every time you look, you find something new, and that would be a big one, obviously. I notice on your website that you have some other drawings of some animals that are clothed. 
what is the story behind those? <laughs> so that was actually um, two buddies of mine wanted uh, commission drawings for their parents' dogs. And so one of them, I don't know where he came up with the idea. It's, the, it's a dog sitting at a bar smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I guess there's some funny family story about their dog doing something like that. I'm not, I don't know the whole backstory, but it, <laughs> it was a, it was a fun project. <laughs> well, and you have to realize, people have to realize this is in hi- hyper realism. So it's not like a little cartoon right. of a dog at a bar. This is like, it looks like a real dog at a bar smoking a cigarette. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And, and then his, his buddy heard about it. And, uh, I guess their family has a story about their dog being a war hero. So I put him in like an old World War Two. uh, World War II uniform, like those old pictures you see him, they're kind of staring off the side of the camera, you know, like yep. the fancy war shots. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it, where that came from. Mostly, a lot of the ideas come from other people. <laughs> <laughs> and then you do a lot of family shots, which I think are really cool because it's not your typical family portrait. It looks like you have a grandmother hugging her granddaughter, you know, a, right. a boy and his dog. Uh, you know, you have your typical portraits, but you also have some creative ones that are a little different and fun so that's really cool yeah those are always i think way more fun than the you know look here and say cheese photos there's a lot more emotion and you know the candid shots that people catch and send me i like those i mean i'll do i'll do all of them but those are more fun do you take the photograph or do they typically provide the photograph almost always they'll take the photo. actually yeah every time they've taken the photograph they send it to me and uh and i can give them a quote and we go from there. Yeah. Okay. And now it looks like you're committed to having a beard for a while since you're called the bearded yeah. artist. Is that correct? Uh, yep. I cleared it with the wife. It's all good. Plus, I hate to shave. So, two birds, <laughs> one stone. <laughs> <laughs> well, as with most career journeys, uh, success largely depends on reliable transportation. And since I'm a huge car enthusiast, could you tell us what was your first car? My first car, I want to say 99 or 2000. Plymouth Acclaim. Do you remember those? I do remember They're, those. Four door, right? Like a four yeah, door sedan. Just a, just a simple little sedan. Um, it was. Kind of, it was. I have two older sisters. They, well, it was my parents, and then they drove it, and then I drove it, and until it fell apart, and then. And I'm not. I'm not a huge car guy. I'm a. I'm a <laughs> so, it, kind of guy. <laughs> right. If they drew it, drove it till it fell apart. Was that like a year and a half? Those things weren't the best built cars in the world. <laughs> yeah, and I kept hearing that, but it, I guess it lasted longer than normal because every time I'd take it in for an oil change, they'd be like, "This thing's going to die soon," and it lasted a few years. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're not a car guy, but do you have a dream car? And if you don't, that's fine. A dream car. So right now, I would love to have a Tesla. Mm. Not only because I'm I'm obsessed with Elon Musk, uh, but uh, I think the Teslas are kind of the next step in the evolution of cars. So if I was gonna have, if I was gonna be a car guy, it would be based on what's the most advanced car. And I think I guess that's probably the most advanced one out there. It pretty much is, yeah. I mean, there's a uh, a, right, su- yeah. a, a Swedish supercar that has a really crazy transmission, but for our purposes, yeah. And those are really cool and cool looking and really fast. So can't go wrong with the Tesla. Right. One perk to some some jobs is having a company car. And if I had all the money in the world, I'd like to buy you a cool company car based on your job. So are you ready for this one? Yes. <laughs> for you, I would pick. It's almost it's kind of the opposite direction of a Tesla, but I think you'll still like it. It's a um. 1967 Volkswagen Westfala camper. Ooh, reason that, that actually makes a lot more business. <laughs> <laughs> well, reason for this is you know it's a camper. It's really cool. It's the VW Bug from the 60s or bus from the 60s, where they had a lot of people do uh, artwork on the outside of them, especially during uh, Woodstock. So they're very uh, artistic, creative, a lot of fun things people did with this bus. And the camper version, mm-hmm. especially the Westfala, Westfala was a company that they outsourced the vans to to make them into camper vans. So you could actually have room for all of your art supplies. You could travel to all your shows and camp versus trying to get a Airbnb. And they had, in 67, that was the last year that they had these really cool 
tents that would attach to the side of the van so it would extend your space and even have an awning. And they're really cool because they're like red and white striped. Uh, so they have this kind of cool feel, and the buses are always cool. So definitely an artistic, fun aspect to them. The downside yeah. is is they're crazy slow. So <laughs> that's the downside. Your pick was way better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, uh, yeah, that sounds that sounds awesome. <laughs> well, when uh when I post this, I'll shoot you some pictures of it because uh, they are truly a classic and cool, fun, artistic. Uh, type of car that I think would be uh, perfect for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking us on your journey today. What's the best way our listeners can learn more about you uh, and your company? Um, you can check me out on the uh, social media pages. Uh, Facebook, it's just Bearded Artist. Instagram is Bearded Artist 513. And Twitter, which I don't know how to use, but it posts to it automatically, is uh, Bearded Artist KN for Kevin Nichols. And you can check my website, it's beardedartist.net. Um, and like I said, I'm kind of in a building phase, cause, so my website may or may not be up to date when you check it. Right. <laughs> try to stay on top, but yeah. And my Etsy page, that is beardedartist.etsy.com. And that's where you can purchase any of my prints and any of my originals. And I do free shipping on there, which is pretty neat for all you Etsy shoppers. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Kevin. Thank you so much, Greg. I I very much appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Learn From Others, where we help others succeed by sharing success. Where will our next adventure take us? Subscribe to find out. If you know of someone who has a cool career story or occupation, contact Greg through Instagram at Greg Stanley LFO. That's G-R-E-G-S-T-A-N-L-E-Y-L-F-O. And we will see you soon as we learn from others together.